Hi, I'm Jamie Jones and this is F-Bomb. The F stands for film and also I swear a lot. Now, before I continue, I should probably clarify what I mean by bomb. In terms of film, it usually means something that's done badly at the box office, which hasn't made as much money back as was put into it. Colloquially, it can also mean something that wasn't well received, whether by critics, audiences or both. But if I've learned anything from my contemporaries, it's not to be boxed in by titular technicalities. So just to be clear right from the start, when it comes to this show, bomb just means any film that I feel has significantly failed in any way. Speaking of significant failure, time to talk about Suicide Squad. Believe it or not, despite this being my first episode, I actually got a request to review this. My wonderful, brilliant, dear friend Jenny suggested that I review this because it was one of the worst films she'd ever seen. This is a woman who once said this about Pirates of the Caribbean 4. It was good. <laughs> so I figured it must be bad. But Jesus Christ, nothing could prepare me for just how fucking bad. This is Suicide Squad. Before we look at the film itself, it's important to look at the marketing campaign that preceded it because that played a big part in its downfall. In my opinion, the best trailer for the movie was the one they showed at Comic-Con. Why? Because it was dark, had gratuitous cameos, and wasn't very interesting. In other words, it was the perfect representation of the movie. But then, Deadpool happened. With the success of that, the release of Ant-Man and Guardians of the Galaxy in previous years, and Lego Batman on the Horizon, it was clear superhero movies were becoming sillier and more self-aware. Unfortunately, DC thought they could become sillier and more self-aware. <coughs> they fucking can't. But they tried anyway, rebranding Suicide Squad as a dark comedy, downgrading the tagline from Justice Has a Dark Side to worst heroes ever, and packing the new trailers with really fucking good editing. Let's go save the world. I don't blame people for getting fooled by it. Hell, I was fooled by it. I also don't blame people for feeling utterly cheated because the movie we were promised was not the movie we got. After some truly putrid opening titles, we meet Deadshot, played by Will Smith. He threatens a guard, who then drags him out to get beaten up by all the other guards. Oh, I get it! Because he's alone! That is a C- effort at best. We then meet Harley Quinn, played by Margot Robbie, easily the standout character, pushed by every marketing campaign and inescapable at Halloween. They really wanted us to like this woman. So why is her introduction so... meh? You wouldn't know it by her actions, but she's meant to be violent, deranged, and unpredictable. We have to be told all these things. Just a whole lot of pretty and a whole lot of crazy. You don't know me. <laughs> you are really in bad shape upstairs, lady. She gets unceremoniously knocked out, and we swiftly move on to Walla, played by Viola Davis, who's meeting with some military types to discuss... to discuss... to... Discuss. I'm sorry, is this Return of the King? <laughs> Fuck, first using sympathy for the devil to introduce your antagonist. The seal is and that is why I'm here. And now this? It's like a film student read how to write villains for dummies and then somehow acquired $175 million. It's possible they're using the constant lip smacking as a distraction from their plan because it makes no fucking sense. Well, you're not gonna pitch us that Task Force X project of yours again, are you? It's taken some work, but I finally have them. The worst of the worst. We got lucky with Superman, he shared our values. The next Superman might not. You're playing with fire, Amanda. I'm fighting fire with fire. So, you're putting together a crack team of criminals because Superman shared your values, which is a contentious point in and of itself. And you're not sure the next Superman will, so you're defending yourself from the next Superman who may or may not share your values and who may or may not exist. I don't fucking get it. Anyway, we then meet Deadshot who, wait, didn't we already meet Deadshot? Like, less than five minutes ago? Whatever. We're reintroduced to Deadshot and his backstory via a barrage of exposition. I know a lot of people had a problem with these text intros, and while I would have preferred the writers try to integrate it into the dialogue, 
I don't think they were up to that task. And frankly, I think they're kind of cool. They have some nice little gags hidden in them and add some much needed texture to this film. So actually, I kind of wish they were used more. Turns out Deadshot had a daughter and he wanted custody of her. Mama stays in bed a lot. Um, she's supposed to be taking care of you, you know? That's how that's supposed to work. Mama says I can't live with you because you kill people. That does sound worse. What was his defense? That's not true. That's a lie. She's lying to you. His defense was gaslighting his family. Yes, please put that man in charge of another human life. He was captured by Batman. Oh, cameo! Everybody drink! You know, I never understood why there was so much hate for Ben Affleck's Batman. I don't want to do this in front of your daughter. Doesn't mean I won't, though. Or just stand by while you hold a gun to her head. Oh, okay, now I get it. Now we meet Harley Qu <sighs> Re meet Harley Quinn and meet ugh, Jared Leto's Joker. And wow, is his performance. I mean, it's utterly. It's so fucking boring! This is a character who should be completely unpredictable, causing anarchy for his own amusement. As his name suggests, a wild card. But I don't get a scrap of that from Leto. His performance is so informed by previous Jokers that you can see every move he makes coming from a mile away. It's so... Super Villain 101, you know? It's safe. Like I'm watching a middle schooler do it. I don't know how else to put it. It's just not good enough. And neither is the editing. I won't harp on this too much since lots of people have gone into this in detail, but look at this shit. Look, are you enjoying yourself? Did you see that? That didn't gel at all. She was starting to sit down and then boom, she sat down, settled and playing with her hair. All they had to do was cut half a second later, but no. We have got company. Betsy, Betsy, Betsy. Oh, cameo, everybody drink. This scene is kind of fun, with one of the few actually funny one-liners. You're ruining date night! She's brought in by Batman, and finally we're all caught up and ready to start the story. Oh no, we have another character to introduce. Hang on, we've had two Batman cameos before we've even met the entire cast? Let me just go back to the editing for a second, because it's one thing to sloppily edit the scenes together, it is another thing entirely to sloppily edit the story together. I don't understand why Deadshot and Harley Quinn get pre-introduction introductions. I mean, I do understand, because Harley Quinn is Harley Quinn and Will Smith is Will Smith. But in terms of storytelling, it's completely benign. The prologue tells us nothing about the characters that we won't learn later on anyway, and adds yet more time to an already overly long film. I mean, I know it's only two hours long, but trust me, it feels a lot longer. So we meet the rest of the crew. Captain Boomerang, played by Jai Courtney. No honor among thieves, eh? Oh, cameo! Everybody drink! Diablo, played by Jay Hernandez. Killer Croc, played by Aduali Ikinawi Agbaji. I am so sorry for definitely pronouncing that incorrectly. And Dr. June Moon. Yes, yeah, seriously, June Moon. AKA Enchantress, played by Cara Delevingne, whose heart is in the possession of Walla. Wallace shoved her into the life of yet another character, Colonel Rick Flagg, played by Joel Kinnaman, so that he would fall in love with her, so he would be more likely to follow Wallace's orders, because she has control of his lover's heart. That's a lot of information to get in 30 seconds. <laughs> Why wasn't this in the prologue? The emotional centre of the story? The climax of the film? Eh, just cram it in the 20 minute mark amongst all the other exposition. I'm sure everyone will have stopped caring by now anyway. Walla takes June to the Pentagon, Yet, yeah, thanks movie, wouldn't have realised that Pentagon-shaped building was the Pentagon without you telling me. This scene is boringly repetitive and definitely should have been integrated with the last scene introducing all the characters. But we do get an amazing transition effect. Enchantress. Does anyone else find that kind of sexy? <laughs> No? Just me. Okay. Right, so they go to the prison to pick up the new team, and finally the story- No! My mistake! Now they have to convince the team to work for them. Wow, you are just determined to never start, aren't you, movie? Killer Croc and, surprisingly, Harley Quinn get very brief induction scenes. Diablo doesn't want to join because he's trying to be peaceful now. What's the point of that tank if you can still make fire in it? And Deadshot has a way too long induction scene that furthers nothing. 
We already know he has animosity with asshole cop. Colonel, for the record, this is exactly what I was concerned about. We already know he's a good shot. Clues in the name. And we already know he wants custody of his daughter. So why bother? Back to the Joker, who is, I guess, mourning the disappearance of Harley in his circle of knives, guns, booze, piano keys, and baby clothes. Well, we've all been there. I'm not gonna strain myself figuring out what this is symbolic for, because I suspect the answer is nothing. June inadvertently summons Enchantress and shows Rick a vision of June dying. Want to know why? Well, tough shit. Then she makes it to Waller's place to steal her heart back, but there's some sort of security device on it. Earlier she was shown breaking into and stealing from Iranian war rooms, but this stops her. Okay, sure. In another room she finds a statue which transports her to her brother. Oh joy, another character. Whose name is Incubus, apparently. I had to look that one up in the credits. Again, she can breach Iranian war rooms, but she can't destroy humanity without a machine. I do not understand the limitations of this character's power. She then returns to June's body. If you have to choose between her or me, stop her. Promise me you'll stop her. Wow, that's actually pretty powerful. Showing bravery and self-sacrifice, even though she's clearly frightened. Even if it kills me. And you ruined it by saying it out loud and destroying the tension. Elsewhere, Incubus goes on a rampage through the subway, which would have been really cool if it had lasted longer than a millisecond. Enchantress is deployed to plant a bomb to kill her brother, but she defects. Because how else would asking an evil witch to plant a bomb to kill her brother end? Walla tries to subdue her by stabbing her heart, but Incubus restores her. Or you could just take it back now. I mean, you, you know the box is open because it was just stabbed. And you know exactly where it is, so you could get it back in a nanosecond. No? Wanna do the convoluted thing? Okay, fuck it. She shoots some sort of blue beam into the sky. Never seen that before. And chaos reigns. Our weapons are ineffective. I thought this was contained! I know, it's shocking this plan to turn all the bad guys against each other didn't work. No, not shocking. Uh, the other thing. Inevitable. The Suicide Squad is finally put to some use, and we get to actually meet Captain Boomerang. Only half an hour after he was first introduced. We also meet another new character, Slipknot, played by Adam Beach, and we get the witty one-liner section of the movie. You were caught robbing a diamond exchange. Oh, those not. You might want to work on your team motivation thing. You heard of Phil Jackson? Yeah. He's like the gold standard, okay? Triangle, bitch. If you like a girl, can you light her a cigarette with your pinky? Because that would be real classy. But without the wit. Wait, what's that crap on your face? Is it wash off? They get into the chopper and finally get go- you're late. You all got them. Oh, you have got to be shitting me! Pro tip! If you're still introducing main characters almost an hour into your movie, you have too many fucking characters! Yes, Marvel did that thing where they had lots of characters all smushed together, but they had a plethora of feature-length movies beforehand to establish those characters. Please stop trying to be Marvel, DC! You fucking suck at it! Anyway, this is Katana, played by Karen Fukuhara, and she kicks ass. I know this because she's shown kicking ass in a flashback, and also because Rick tells us. She can cut all you in half with one sword stroke, just like mowing the lawn. Thanks, Captain Obvious. I mean, Colonel Obvious. What did I just say about not being Marvel? That is shameless. I know Guardians doesn't own that song, but that is so fucking blatant. Anyway, they get shot out of the sky, which isn't dramatic or suspenseful, because of course none of them are gonna die yet. And we get some more quality time with the squad, as they all plan to escape. Because the writers thought the audience were too stupid to realise that they try to escape. Then they try to escape. Hold your fire! I 
I'm sorry, that is the fucking lamest thing I've ever seen in a comic book movie. Whee! Boing! Splat. But at least the Suicide Squad now knows their place, and a new and exciting dynamic- Now that's killer out. You just threatened me. Oh right, they don't care, because they're hardened criminal sociopaths. <laughs> Duh. Some monster mutant thingies created by Enchantress attack the squad. Get used to that, by the way, they are literally the only enemy until the final fight. And we get an incredibly stilted action scene. Bang, 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 slam, 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 bish, bash, bosh. And it wouldn't be a shitty action scene if it didn't rip off the cool slow-mo from The Matrix, whilst completely failing to understand what made the slow-mo from The Matrix cool in the first place. Except this bit. That's a nice little callback. Diablo, sticking to his pacifism, missed the fight entirely, and Captain Boomerang makes fun of him for it. Oh, yeah, you're the fire bloke, eh? Yeah, I was, yeah. All right, yeah, hey. Okay, that's a little funny. Well, looky here. Ooh, it's fire! Ooh! And now it's not. Stop over-explaining your jokes! You're not a fucking Wayans Brothers movie! And cue the line from the trailer that tricked us all into seeing this shit heap. We're bad guys. It's what we do. I can't even fake a smile. We then get an out of nowhere flashback that shows us... nothing. It seems like it should be a key moment in the history of Harley Quinn and the Joker because it's triggered by a visual cue, but it's not. It's not the moment he lets her into his life, and I'm pretty certain it's not the moment she snaps because she's already really adept at this stuff. And again, it doesn't tell us anything we didn't already know. He was resistant to her. Well. Yeah, you already told us that in the first flashback. The second flashback? No, the first flashback. I forget, but it was there. The bike stunt is kind of cool, I suppose, but is kind of cool really the best we can hope for? She breaks off from the group to meet the Joker, but the others catch up with her. Somehow. So that was completely pointless. Oh, except to have another fight scene with the mutants from before. So yeah, completely pointless. We go straight to yet another fucking fight with the same fucking mutants. Gotta fill up that runtime somehow, I suppose. And writing fun characters with snappy dialogue is hard work! I will admit, this fight scene is the most interesting so far, with some effort put into the choreography and a lot less slow-mo. Oh, and Diablo finally does something. It's not very impressive, but it's something. I guess he has an arc then. Probably would have clocked onto that sooner if he projected any kind of emotion whatsoever. Look at that. He's just been tricked into using the violence he spent god knows how long trying to contain, and he looks about as angry as someone whose waiter took their order to the wrong table. They ascend to the top of the building to find... Oh, for fuck's sake, another flashback? And it's Harley's again? I don't care! Although it does contain probably my favourite line of the movie. Would you die for me? That's too easy. Will you... Would you live for me? I mean, the delivery is terrible, of course, because Leto makes an atrocious Joker, but the line itself is pretty damn good. And it's the first time I've thought the writers actually had a handle on what the Harley-Joker relationship was even about. The rest of the scene is absolute garbage in comparison, although the soundtrack is working hard to convince me that this is dramatic. <laughs> When really, it's just... happening. So it turns out they've stormed the building to pick up Waller. We kill the pair of them now before they kill us. Makes sense. Even though you just announced your plan out loud, you still outnumber them. Don't get high-spirited on me and ruin a good day. You still outnumber them. I mean, she can't kill all of you, just jump them and... No? Okay then. They get to the helicopter, but it's been commandeered by the Joker. And this is as close to being the Joker that Jared Leto ever gets. <laughs> Just look how happy he is firing that gun blindly into the darkness. It's adorably scary. Her explosive tracker disabled, Harley makes her escape. But Deadshot is ordered to kill her. I missed. Well, that was a direct order that he blatantly, purposely disobeyed, so... You should probably kill him now. No? Okay. They do manage to shoot down Joker's chopper. Ah! 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 Wow, I feel really bad. 
The weird elephant noises made me so emotionally invested. <coughs> Wallace Chopper is also taken down by Incubus, and Rick sounds like he cares about as much as I do. Let's go get her. They catch up with Harley, whose fake crazy is about as believable as her real crazy. Hey guys, I'm back! And they push on to find Walla, who has been captured by Enchantress, who steals her heart back and OH MY GOD HOW IS THIS FILM STILL GOING?! IT FEELS LIKE IT SHOULD HAVE ENDED FUCKING HOURS AGO! But instead of putting the pedal to the metal, the film decides to take a little breather as the squad goes to a bar. <coughs> Age revolt song. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> I had a frog in my... What I meant to say was, this is a complete rip-off of Avengers Age of Ultron. Except where the Avengers are a fun group of people who have wacky hijinks with god hammers, the Suicide Squad are morose, unpleasant, and unfunny. I don't kill women or children. I do. Yay fun. Actually, there is one funny thing. Diablo trying to be street sounds just like Butters trying to be a pimp. Flaghead, you chasing a carrot on a stick, homie. You played yourself, dog. See, after school, do you know what I am saying? After flashback number 827, they return to the fight. After a brief and utterly inconsequential bit of drama from Katana, the man who killed her husband used that sword. His soul's trapped inside of it. Colonel Obvious, at your service. They confront Enchantress. And is it just me, or does it sound like they used the wrong voiceover take for this? So those who cage you, I am your ally. Her jerky body movements imply chaos and lack of control but her voice is calm and very controlled. I'd love to give this movie the benefit of the doubt and say it was a stylistic choice to create a sense of unease, but nah. She shows them visions of their desires, which I guess is supposed to weaken them, but they snap out of it really easily and if anything, it just pisses them off and makes them more ready to fight. And what a fight it is. Prepare to be amazed as the Suicide Squad rallies together and mostly just stands there and lets Diablo do all the work. Gripping. He sacrifices himself and completes his redemption arc that started about 10 minutes ago when he mentioned that bad thing that he did. What was it? I don't kill women or children. I do. Oh, yeah, he killed children. Yeah, that, that's probably something that should have left an impact on me. Just Enchantress left to go and the rest of the squad finally enter the battle. <laughs> let you know who's winning, but I'm not even sure who's fighting. Harley finally gets the heart out so they can end this. Her heart's out! We can end this! Okay, Colonel Obvious, calm the fuck down. Now all that's left to do is chuck an explosive at her and shoot it. There is a difference between heightening the tension and holding your audience hostage. Please end this. Please, Daddy, don't do it. No, no, don't shoot the girl. I don't care if it ends this quick as shoot her in the fucking face. After another 12 years of slow mo, he, of course, shoots the gun. And the battle is finally over. Oh, and June survives. Oh, good. I was really hoping she pulled through. Totally didn't forget she even existed. So to wrap up, Deadshot occasionally gets to see his daughter, Harley has an espresso machine, Killer Croc has a TV, Captain Boomerang's in solitary, and Diablo is dead. What a happy ending. Gotta leave room for that sequel bait though. Let's go home. Yes, please let me go home. There is a mid credit sequence with Waller and Bruce Wayne, but I just cannot summon the energy to care. And that was, simply put, one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. And not in a fun way. All the bad editing and bad writing and bad acting doesn't have enough charm to make it a so bad it's good disaster. It's just a disaster. The main problem for me was the focus. More of it should have been given to Enchantress, the main antagonist. But so much time is also given to Harley Quinn, the Joker, Deadshot, Rick Flagg, Waller and Diablo with enough tidbits of the other characters so we don't forget they exist, although sometimes I still do, that Enchantress's presence gets completely overshadowed. 
This is augmented by most of the other characters also being antagonistic. With all the tension and deception within the team itself, it's easy to forget what they're supposed to be fighting against. I'm not joking, this review took me weeks to write. Partly because I ended up with so much material I had to cut well over half of it, and partly because subjecting myself to this movie multiple days in a row was just exhausting. And that's this movie in a word. Exhausting. I could call it plenty of other words, but let's stick with that one. Thank you for watching, I've been Jamie Jones. Join me next week when I will be looking at this film. See you next Tuesday, fuckers!